Good morning, everybody. How are you this doing this morning? Yeah, great. Happy Easter. Uh, if you're watching online, I apologize for the technical difficulties. You are streaming from my iPhone this morning. So thank you for hanging in there with us. But perhaps you're new. Perhaps you're not particularly religious. Perhaps you're watching online. We are creating the Front Church for you because we want as many people as possible to experience Jesus' story. My name is Nate, and I have the honor of being the lead pastor of the Front Church. We're going to dive right in this morning. Scripture is going to be on the screen, but you can also op open or turn on your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, the Front is the perfect church for you because we try and talk about the Bible in a way that everyone can understand. Now, all of us are on different spectrums when it comes to faith, and so some of us will maybe be able to put together a little bit more than others of us, but we try and talk about the Bible in a relatable way, and so we're so happy that you are here this morning. Now, the story we're about to read is often mistitled the story of the prodigal son, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, so we'll get to why that's the wrong title for this story in a little bit. But let's get going. Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. I love this about Jesus. He, Jesus, there's something compelling about him. There's something that people on the margins and on the edges like Jesus. And yet he's always upsetting the religious people of his day. You know why? Because he's going to keep insisting that those religious deem far from God are not actually far from God. And so wherever you're coming from, I recognize some of us might be very religious. Some of us might not be religious at all. Some of us might be spiritual, but not religious. I know that a lot of us see a disconnect between Jesus and institutions, whatever tradition you're from. But I think we find ourselves hoping like, man, but if this Jesus story were true, I mean, it, I think it's compelling. I think it has changed and is changing the world. And at the Front Church, we believe Jesus is still working. So Luke sets us up right away. Jesus has two people, two types of people in his audience. He has the tax collectors and sinners, quote unquote, tax collectors and sinners. Those guys were notoriously like you didn't hang out with them. You didn't consider them good company. You didn't consider them good people to be around. Tax collectors and sinners had a bad reputation, but yet they're, they're in the audience. And then you have the religious people in the audience, and they're muttering to themselves, this man, you know the company he keeps? So he's got two types of people in his audience, and so he's going to tell them three parables. We're going to skip the first two and jump to the third. Cool? Okay, let's go. Oh! Wait, 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 wait. He's going to tell him a story. We are starting a new series at the front called Let Me Tell You a Story. And it's going to be on the parables of Jesus. He always seems to be speaking in parables. And a lot of times we think parables are kind of cute little stories with some cute little meaning. But I'm convinced that parables are this subversive story device, this narratival device that is intended to turn the world upside down and help us dream of a new world that is possible. And so over the next six weeks, I hope you join us because these parables are going to help us look at like, what is God like? Uh, what, what is the world he's inviting us to dream of? What do we do with the wounds that we carry in our lives? Um, what could a world marked by forgiveness and self-giving love look like? What does the world look like when there's a community of Jesus's people following him? So now, parable number one of our series, not the parable of the prodigal son. Let's go. Luke 15, 11. Jesus continued, there's a man who had two sons. This isn't the parable of one son. This is the parable of two sons. Jesus is going to say, let me tell you about a man, a father, who had two sons. And remember, in Jesus' audience, there's two types of people. 
So we're going to see some parallels here. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So his father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. And after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. And he longed, he's so low, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything to eat. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. Uh, I put a Greek word in there for you. Keep going. Go back, Scott. I put a Greek word in there in that slide. And that word is the word anastas. I have a little girl. She's four years old. Her name is Anastasia. Love that name. Anastasia gets its name from the term, the Greek term, anastas, which means resurrection or arising, or to, to be raised. And so twice this word shows up in the Greek. Basically, he's saying, it's saying in verse 18, arising, I'm going to arise and go back to my father. And then verse 20, so he got up, anastas, twice, twice. This is a story here about death and resurrection. Something needs to die so that something else can live. So he thinks, he thinks, he thinks because he is not worthy, his father will want to keep him at a distance. He's like, I'll just go back. My father's going to want to keep me at a distance. Is treat me like your hired servant. He's operating from a premise that his father's welcome is dependent on his worthiness. But something will need to die so something else can live. Let's keep going. But while this younger son was a long way off, his father saw him. He's looking. He saw him and filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. No old man in Jesus' day ran. That was undignified. That brought shame. It's a strange cultural thing. We're like, old men run all the time. We see them run marathons. Not in Jesus' day they didn't. So this father doesn't care what anyone else thinks. He runs and he throws his arms around his son and he kissed him. He's been looking. He runs and he embraces his son. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, the father doesn't even let him finish his apology. He's only halfway through. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found so they began to celebrate. This story Jesus is telling is a story about death and resurrection and a party, which we're going to have one. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother has come back, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Killed the fattened calf. What does that mean? Means he got out the best scotch. I'm a whiskey guy myself. Um, he got out the best wine. He got out the filet mignon for the community. He got out sushi and it was sushi for days. He is ready to party because his son is home. And if you're familiar with this story, and if you're not, that's okay. You're in the perfect church for not knowing the Bible. But if you're familiar with the story, you know that this is kind of where we think the story ends. Hey, the prodigal's back home. The story of the prodigal son, he's back. Big party. But remember, Jesus is speaking to people who know their brokenness, know what they deem as distance from God, and he's telling them this story. But he's also speaking to a crowd of religious people who look down on Jesus because he keeps company with those other people. And so he says, 
he said, there's a man with two sons. And he's going to invite his audience to see the world in a new way. So watch, he keeps going. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. The, 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 this father didn't just go looking for his younger son. He went out looking for his older son. No. But his son answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son... The father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So chapter 15, verse 24 says, when he said this to the community, he said, my son was dead and is alive again. He's lost and now he's found. Verse 24 says, so they threw a party. So they started to celebrate. And now the father says the same thing to the older son. This brother of yours who was dead is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. So, And that's where Jesus ends his story. What's he doing? Who do you think he's looking at at this point when he's telling the story? Like, is he looking at the tax collectors in the centers and giving them a wink. Like, I, I, I'm a terrible winker. I'm sure you just noticed that. I'm a terrible winker. Or is he looking at the religious people who have been looking down at him and the other crowd and the people who they think are far from God? Is he looking at them and he's saying, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. So you should be excited about this. I bet he held there. I bet Jesus isn't afraid of tension like me and conflict. And so I bet Jesus is just holding their stare. Like, do you understand what I'm saying here? This is a parable about death and resurrection. Anastas would tip us off, that Greek word, that would tip off Luke's audience, Luke's audience that he's writing to, like, oh, yeah, and then if we needed things any clearer, twice this, this son or this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, he's lost and he's found. This should tip us off. There's something going on here. There's allusions to death and resurrection here. Something needs to die for something else to live. I think that's what Jesus is always inviting us to. Something dies so something else can live. And this is true for both the younger brother, who's quite famous, if you're familiar with the Bible, and the older brother, who we all kind of forget to talk about. This parable is also a parable about what we do with our wounds. We all got them. We all come with pain and hurt, heartache. The younger son has some wounds in this story, right? He was at the end of, the ro of his rope. He's broken. His spirit was broken. His life in this moment is not according to plan. He did not see it ending up this way. He finds himself feeding pigs. Some of his wounds are of his own doing, and some of his wounds are of people who've done things to him. And maybe you're there. Maybe you're there right now. No, he doesn't feel worthy. He knows he's not worthy. So he cooks up this apology to his dad. And he thinks his dad's going to keep him at a distance. I'll just be like one of his servants. You know what? That needs to die so something else can live. His father, what he doesn't know, but what he's about to find out, his father has been looking. His father's going to run. His father is going to interrupt his apology and give him a big old hug and throw a party for him. His father 
despite his being unworthy, will not keep him at a distance. His old view of his father needs to die so he can live. When, when we bring our wounded selves to God, we can experience healing. The older son has wounds too here in the story. Right? He's presumed certain things to be true about his father. He has, he's, the same, he's kind of in the same boat as the younger son, but it plays out differently. He thinks his father's approval is earned. And so his, he thinks his father will demand proof of worthiness before, before looking. He thinks his father is going to demand proof of worthiness before running towards him, before he gets an embrace from his father, before giving before his father grants him full access to his presence. And so he's been working hard. He's been working hard. But this is a parable. Not just about younger sons and older sons, but about God and what God is like. And for the older son, his view of his father needs to also die so that something else can live. And you know, there's wounds that come with that. I lived my whole life thinking you were this way. I lived my whole life working under these premises. And, and, and it feels like a waste. Like, you're telling me that's not how it goes? That's not how it works? What, is, what, what could life look like if I'm not living this way, if it's actually a different way? What does that even look like? There's a way he's understood his father to work. But in the story, his father stands outside the party, and he's inviting him in to a new way of understanding how he actually works. Do you know that's how God actually works? There is a way we've understood God to work. Some of us have understood God to, we think God's going to demand proof of our worthiness before he goes looking for us. We think God's going to demand proof of our worthiness before he comes running to us, before he embraces us, before he gives us access to his full presence. And Jesus is inviting us to let that view of our father die so that something else can live And so his story, not just about a prodigal, in his story, Jesus is inviting both types of people, religious and irreligious, both types of people, those who kind of live by all the rules and those who didn't give, didn't care about the rules. He's inviting both types of people into a new view about what God is like and who God is. And he's inviting both of them to the party. You know, the thing that gets me about this story is, you know what that older brother should have done after his younger brother took off? He should have went after him. He should have went after him. He didn't. But today is Easter. Today is Easter Sunday. And on Easter Sunday, we get to remember that through Jesus' cross and resurrection, Jesus ran after us. He's come for us. He's done what this older brother should have done. He's pursued us. He brings us his presence. He's not withholding anything from us. He doesn't leave us in the mud. He gets in the mud with us. Something has gone wrong in our relationship with God, and he didn't say, okay, you fix it. He said, I I got this. I'll fix it. And just as in Jesus' story about the father and his two sons, For the younger son, something has to die. His old view of his father has to die so that he can live. The younger son's new life begins when he realizes what he's been doing hasn't been working. The older son's new life in this story can begin when he realizes what he's been doing hasn't 
been working. The people in Jesus' audience, as Jesus is telling this story, the people in Jesus' audience, their new life can begin when they realize what they've been doing hasn't been working. Your new life this morning, this morning, can begin when we realize what we've been doing hasn't been working and we embrace what Jesus is inviting us to. And so we, that's kind of the start of our journey with Jesus is a confession. The younger son wasn't wrong when he said, I'm not worthy. He wasn't wrong. That's actually something we all need to have on our lips. But he was wrong that he thought because of that, his father would keep him at a distance. God doesn't demand our worthiness to experience his full presence. He doesn't say, make yourself worthy. You stay away until you get things figured out, and then come on and we'll work on this. He doesn't say, make yourself worthy. He says, I'll make you worthy. I'll do it. His earliest followers understood this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and then 14. Look at this. It says, we, that's people in Jesus, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We didn't make ourselves holy. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, we've been made holy. For by one sacrifice, Jesus has made perfect. Jesus made us perfect, not us. We didn't make ourselves worthy. He made us worthy. Jesus has made perfect forever those who are being made holy what, what God desires for us is we say, I'm not worthy, you make me worthy. You gotta do this. You gotta fix this. I'm a terrible fixer. Aren't you glad that's how God works? I screw this up over and over and over and over again, you guys. If this were on me, I would be screwed. But that's not how it works. All God wants is our admittance. I need you. That's all he's looking for. I need you. And then he's, he's looking for that. I need you. Then he comes running. And then he throws us in an embrace. And then he doesn't, he doesn't even let us finish our apology. And then he throws a party for us because he's not keeping us at a distance because we're unworthy. He makes us worthy and we get to be close. Many of you guys have showed up this morning and I think you might be wondering, like, is Jesus still at work? Is God far away? Can God heal my wounds? Is God keeping me at a distance? Does God love me? Is God the type of father who withholds his embrace until I show that I'm worth it? I think some of you this morning, if you're honest with yourselves, you, you, maybe a friend invited you, maybe a family member, and you're, and, and, and you're here for them, but you kind of have this like hope you're not maybe brave enough to voice it or even pray it, but you kind of just have this hope. Like, God, if you're real, if you're even there, I need you. The meaning of Jesus' cross is Jesus says, let me take your distance. Let me take your brokenness. Let me take your unworthiness. Let me take your spiritual death. Let me take that on myself on the cross. And then in my resurrection, how about you take my life? You take my closeness. I'll take your distance. You take my closeness with the Father. I'll take your spiritual death. You take my life. Jesus' cross is also the cross that says, I'm the God who gets in the mess with you. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, He was delivered up for our trespasses, but raised for our justification. He was delivered up for our trespasses. He gets in the mud with us. I think if Jesus were in this story, Jesus would have been right there with the younger brother. He would have been in the mud with them, and he'd be like, I'll stay here. You get going home. Jesus' cross invites us to take our view of God or the divine or whatever traditions we're a part of and to have them reshaped around who he is. 
And Jesus' resurrection makes possible eternal life. Sometimes when we think eternal life, I think we think heaven when we die. Well, that's part of it. But eternal life is so much more about a quality of life available to us who, who learn to trust Jesus now. And it doesn't mean everything's going to go great. It doesn't mean that all your problems are going to be solved. But it means that God's presence living in you in the midst of chaotic life and all the things that come and all the things that can come out of nowhere and all the unexpected hits and all this stuff. Jesus' presence lives within us. And there's a quality of life. There's a, there's a substance. There's something that, that, that cannot touch that. And that doesn't just, we don't have to wait for that. We can have it now. And today we celebrate because Jesus was raised from the dead. And that means if it looks like death, that doesn't mean it's going to end in death. If it looks like death, Jesus brought life. If it looks like darkness, Jesus can bring light. If it looks like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, sometimes God does his best work then. So will everyone bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute? And I, want, I think it's important for us as we're thinking about this story and as we're thinking about Easter Sunday and we're thinking about how Jesus has come to bring life, how Jesus invites something to die for something else to live, as we're thinking about our view of the Father and the view of the Father that Jesus is painting for us in this story, as we're thinking about those things, I think it's important to just spend a moment reflecting. To right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed to spend a moment for God allowing God's spirit to work just like Jesus's audience in this room today there's two types of people too And for both types of us, whether we're more like a younger son or more like an older son, Jesus is inviting something to die so something else can live. If you hear the story of the two sons and the father and you find yourself identifying more with the younger son, you're, you're in the mud. You're thinking, I'm not worthy. You're thinking, surely God keeps his distance from me until I do some self-cleaning, until I get some stuff straight. If that's what you're thinking right now and you're identifying with that younger son, if that's you and this morning you want to take Jesus up on his invitation and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you in my life. If that's you and you are saying to Jesus right now in your heart, Jesus, I need you in my life. Could you just raise your hand in the air so I could pray for you real quick? Could you just let me know? Thank you. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. If that's you just in your heart right now, reflecting on this story, would you pray this simple prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I'm not worthy. I invite you into my life. Take my brokenness. Take my wounds. Take my sin on your cross. Give me your resurrection life. Come into my life. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed, I have a feeling, and this is oftentimes me too, and we got some older sons in the bunch, some older sons in the audience this morning, and I have news for you. The Father has come looking for you too. He wants to invite you back into relationship with him too. And your old view of the father needs to die. 
And you also need to admit, I am not worthy, God, I need you. I invite you into my life. If you are an older son right now, and you are ready to let the old, your old view of the Father go, and to embrace Jesus' view of the Father that he teaches right now, if you're ready to let that old view of the Father go, and embrace the new view of the Father that Jesus teaches, would you just raise your hand real quick so that I can pray for you? Yes, 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 yes. If that's you, I'd like you to just pray this prayer in your heart with me as well. Dear Jesus, I'm not worthy. I invite you into my life. Show me what the Father is really like. Take my brokenness. Take my wounds. Take my sin on your cross. Grant me your resurrection life. God, come into my life. If you guys can look up, that'd be for all of us in this room. Your Father has been looking for you. Your Father is a Father who when we admit our need for Him, He runs to us. Your Father is a Father who's not withholding His embrace, but He's ready to give His embrace. And your Father is a Father who wants to throw a party and invite you into the new way of seeing him. That is the Easter message. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for revealing to us what our Father is like. We thank you for coming for us, for dying for us, for, right, for being raised for us, and we praise you in your name. Amen.